I wanted to see your think about you. Is he in any position of authority to, to? He's the merchandise weasel. Yeah, but so why bother? Because we wanted everybody to be happy and we were trying to do things the right way. And that's what happens when I try to do things the right way and don't yell and scream at people. That's why I've yelled and screamed at so many people. So I said, tell you what, Ross, you, this Saturday night, I said, call us on Monday and we'll talk more about it. He didn't call any of us on Monday. He called Joe Coff on Monday and said, well, this guy's threatened me and this and that. And, that. and he made a stink and he intimidated or intimated that he would call Human Resources in Sinclair Broadcasting and file because he wouldn't feel safe in his work environment. And because his little balls, if you took Ross's balls and you rolled them in a drinking straw, it looked like a kernel of corn rolling into a storm drain. And, he, and his pussy hadn't been powdered. And he was on his fucking rag that fucking week because he's a fucking gutless prick. And he was upset, so he threatened a human resources complaint. So Joe Coff has just bought this company for Sinclair Broadcasting and don't want human resources calls, so he said, Ixnay Adam Pierce. Guess what that did? That meant that we had no color guy and couldn't figure out a color guy. Because we didn't just want some independent wrestling guy to be the color guy. We wanted to break out of the pack good, right? Well, we thought of Nigel McGinnis, but the problem was Nigel McGinnis was still under contract to TNA. And so we called Nigel and we said, can you get out of this? He said, well, I'm working on it now because they're that, that whole thing was drama for another day. I was the backup color guy. I was going to have to be the executive producer and the matchmaker and the color guy also until 13 days before our first taping, Nigel got his release, release. from TNA. And we had told Joe Coff, Nigel has some strong points, former world champion. The fans will respect him. He knows the product. Negative is he's never done color before, he's got an accent, and it may be difficult for some people, even if it's English, it, you know, so be aware of this and we'll work with him. And Kevin Kelly made it a project that he was going to work with Nigel and bring him up to speed on announcing as best he could. Well, from the start, Joe didn't like Nigel's commentary because, well, he's not excited enough and he, I can't really understand his accent and he doesn't have everything we had said and he's inexperienced. So Kevin worked with him and worked with him and he got better and he got better and he got more into it and gradually by the next spring, all the fans on the internet and the Wrestling Observer poll and everybody, well, they're the best announced team in the business and Joe still didn't like his announcing and wanted me to be the announcer. I said, I can pop the corn too, Joe, but you know, no. So then finally, when we floated the idea of making Nigel the matchmaker and bringing in Adam as the announcer, Joe said, yes. So what about Ross? Well, it's been a year and a half now. He's going to have to, I'll talk to him. He's going to have to get over it. So we can make the deal <coughs> because Adam had already made one show for us in Fort Lauderdale when part of the deal, getting, getting the building for my friend who was an NWA promoter was that we would, you know, send a Ring of Honor guy to his NWA, Howard Brody. What the fuck? Everybody knows who it is. We sent Adam Cole and myself worked his show and then Adam Pierce came over, returned the favor and worked one of our shows and, and that way everybody was happy. And there had been no murders and no incidents. And of course, Ross, you know, pouted like a little goddamn schoolgirl with a shiny new vibrator over in the front and didn't come back. And so anyway, Adam was willing to shake his hand. I don't want to talk to him. Yeah, well, okay. So I call Adam Pierce and I book him for Final Battle and the first TV of 2013, make the deal on his money and tell him he's got the job going forward. And uh, we're really excited about it. And Hunter calls him, does the same thing. Ross gets wind that he's the surprise new announcer and without calling Joe Coff, calls Human Resources in Sinclair and files a complaint and Human Resources, who we have found out have more power than the federal government in the corporate world because if Human Resources says, go home and choke your mother, your mother's fucked. She ain't gonna make it, right? They call Joe and say, no, don't bring this guy in. This, uh, Ross says he will be, you know, his life has been threatened and he'll be unsafe and blah, 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 and he'll sue us, which was going to be Ross's way of probably getting some money and getting out of there uh, because he hated Greg as bad as everybody else did and merchandise sales were down because they cost too much because Greg raised all the prices while they lowered the quality, and et cetera, et cetera. We were giving them a good deal and they still pulled the rug out from under us. You can well, explain that later on. I, I, don't even, I don't even know about that because right. that, you know, of all the things that were, of all the shit pies that were flying at me, that wasn't one that I even saw coming to duck. It may have, you know, gone somewhere else. Yeah. But anyway, so fortunately, this happened the week after Bell Vernon, and I wasn't the one that, because I would have quit then, but I would have been the one to have to call Adam Pearson, debook him, mm. a guy with kids at the holidays that had just been promised a new job that he was happy about, mm. because Ross Abrams, the merchandise weasel, 
was able to dictate the color commentator on a program airing on 60 or 70 something broadcast television stations across the country because he's a pussy and couldn't get over the fact that three years beforehand a guy in the wrestling business had said he wanted to beat the fuck out of him because he was a prick. So fuck you, Ross. You fucking pussy weasel. You fucked one of the boys. You fucked the television program. You fucked our plans for your own selfish pussy fucking purposes. And I still have a hole in my garage wall that was put there by this fist when I heard the fucking news because you're a fucking little prick. Okay, so backing up. Bell Vernon. <clears throat> that was no, the first weekend of November. So October, September, back around, around the last or middle of August. We were talking about the TV tapings for the end of the year and also now in October, November, and December of 2012, that's three months, right? Ring of Honor ran four events in three months and at the holidays. And the guys don't get paid unless they work. And, we're, and well, in the fourth quarter, the profit and loss, according to Greg, we shouldn't lose money because he, he wouldn't take into account that if you lose money on a live event just selling the gate and merchandise, you have a DVD of that event that you're going to sell forevermore until the end of time. Right. And also the, the TV stations can sell sponsorships. Mm -hmm. But no, the live event has to make money, which, well, guess what? I don't think so. All events is live events make money right. just on the live event. <laughs> so for the fourth quarter, they didn't want to. So the boys had four shows to work in, in the last three months of the year. So they weren't happy about that. But also they wanted to get out of Baltimore. I said, why do we want to get out of Baltimore? It's one successful town. Well, because of the building rent and it's so expensive to rent the shit. Well, if we, gosh, I wish we'd have thought we could have the stuff already. But, you know, anyway, why we were in Pittsburgh and Pittsburgh was a great crowd. Let's go to Pittsburgh. But it wasn't actually Pittsburgh. It's Bell Vernon, Pennsylvania, oh. the Ross Raver Ice Rink. And we had been there in, at the end of June for a house show and drew 500 people. Well, there was this little thing also that signing autographs live in person that night as a favor to Gary Jester was Bruno Sammartino in fucking Pittsburgh. The first time Ring of Honor's ever gone to Pittsburgh, Bruno signing autographs, we draw 500 people. So because of that, they want to come back in November to the same place with no Bruno, with no Bruno. and do a TV taping. First time ever in three months that we're going to be in Pittsburgh. On the conference call with everybody, and I've mentioned the, uh, the weekly argument between me and Greg, I said, look, number one, we have a TV studio in Baltimore where we shoot our promos, where we have our locker set and our good lighting, and it's upstairs from the offices and where we do our editing. We have the building in Baltimore where at least everybody knows how to, how to all the people know how to, how to you know, build it out for yep. television and how to run the equipment and everything, and the guys know how to work it. And we're right there so we, we can start post-production the very next day and get these shows turned around because it was always four or five days afterwards that we'd do post-production 12 hours or more a day to get the shows done. I said, in, in Ross Draver at the Ice Garden in Bell Vernon, not only are we an hour from the Pittsburgh airport, but we don't have the, 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 the studio to do the promo day the day before. Also, the place looks like shit for television unless we heavily pipe and drape it. The crowd is going to be down because we've just been there. We don't have Bruno, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to do five TVs, five weeks of TV leading up to Final Battle, the biggest show of the year. We need to have this shit look good. But it's going to be cheaper. Basically, they were going to save $20,000. Mm -hmm. Now, $20,000 sounds like a lot of money. Besides, until you realize that Sinclair Broadcasting buys television stations for $100 million, then it's not so much. But also, $20,000 divided by five weeks of TV is $4,000 per week of TV. Divide that by the 60-something or however many stations at the time they were on, is $40 per station per show per week. Mm -hmm. Right? I was almost willing to take up a fucking collection. And Gary Jester says, well, it's Greg's idea. Let's just try it once. And then Gary Jester says to me in front of everybody on the conference call, Jim, we have almost three months to make it look good. And we know if we don't, you'll never let us forget it. All right, motherfucker, my old friend, my partner that's turned on me and fucking rolled over. Very good. I'm not going to say another word about it. We're going to go to Bell Vernon. We're going to do TV, right? <laughs> so here is the week, and this goes. This is supposed to be a therapy session, right? And since I, I told you, you know, breaking kayfabe, I had told you, yeah, yeah just that. <clears throat> I had told you 
I've never had a substance abuse problem. I've never been in prison. Nobody in my family's ever killed each other. What the fuck could I talk about? But this started part of my therapy because I'm wrestling crazy. So this was part of my therapy. This was my mindset the week going into that. My anniversary, my wedding anniversary is October 31st. It's Halloween because that's Stacy's favorite holiday. And our weekly conference call was usually on Tuesday. I would leave on Thursday morning to go up to Bell Vernon for the Friday promo day and the Saturday taping. Then I would go on to Baltimore on Sunday where we would do post-production on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So I told my old friend Gary, I'm not going to do your goddamn conference call this week because I'm not going to argue with Greg because Stace and I are going to get ready on Tuesday for our anniversary on Wednesday before I have to leave town for a week. I had been asking Gary Jester on the phone in personal private conversations and on emails for the previous two months. We've got to do something, Gary, you and me, as grown, adult, 50-year-old white men, to go and talk to Joe Coff, who's a grown, adult, 60-year-old white man. <laughs> and I'm not saying Greg's black. I'm just saying we're, we're all of this. It's not like there's a goddamn culture clash here. There's not like it's young guy versus old guy or black versus white. You and me and Joe were all adult, over 50-year-old fucking men that ought to be able to sit down in a room and say, regardless of whether you like this little prick or not, he has alienated everybody. Nobody wants to do business with him. Nobody wants to talk to him. Nobody likes him. And he's fucking shit up. We have got to be able to do that. And I don't want to be the odd duck, Gary. I don't want to be the only one, again, bitching and complaining like Jim Cornette always supposed to do. I'm trying to get you to go with me. Oh, Jim, I wish you wouldn't let... Greg bother you so much. Oh, Jim, he sounded like Barnett. Oh, Jim, I wish you wouldn't get so upset about this. Well, I am upset about this because I've promised these guys they're going to have work. I've promised these fans they're going to have this great television production. I've promised everybody that credible wrestling can work. And this fucking prick, through little things and big things, is chipping away at every part of the idea and not only doing it, but alienating everybody in the process. Ross, the merchandise weasel, before I was mad at him for vetoing Adam Pierce the second time, would come up and hand me a package of the new DVDs and say, here, here's our overpriced DVDs. And fucking, you know, everybody in production would go, well, we would have done that, but Greg said there wasn't any money for it or this or that or the other thing. And the, like I said, he alienated two ring crews, ran them off, talked to them like field hands. He was smart ass to a lot of the boys. <laughs> he was definitely a smart ass to me. <laughs> so anyway, on Tuesday, I don't do the conference call because Stace and I run around doing stuff. On Tuesday night, though, I see an email that I happen to check. He took that opportunity while I wasn't on the conference call to make the announcement that beginning in March in Chicago, the pay-per-view and TV taping to save money would be done the same weekend in the same building. Saturday night, pay-per-view, Sunday afternoon TV. You remember hearing about this, or are you completely in a No, bubble? no, I have it in my writing. Okay, you have it in your writing. Well. Believe me, I didn't need it in fucking writing to know it was a fucked up idea. And I knew it wasn't going to work, and I called Gary Jester immediately. I go, what the, when the fuck did this happen? Well, today on the conference call, Gary, Greg said it will save so much money. If, I said, are you fucking out of your mind? I said, not only on a performance standpoint, do these guys now have to beat the fuck out of each other in Ring of Honor style matches within basically two, twice within 16 hours of each other, but also it's everything that we can do to start at noon and lay the television show out by six or seven o'clock bell mm -hmm. time and then we don't get out till after midnight and then we got to come for a pay-per-view we'd have to get there at eight o'clock the next or the, i'm sorry let me try that again a pay-per-view mm -hmm. and then we get there at eight o'clock the next morning to lay everything out for a two o'clock bell time where the production crew wouldn't leave the building for 36 hours, which came to pass in New York. The producer and director did not leave the building from 9 o'clock on Saturday morning until 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock on Sunday evening. I said it's going to kill the fucking house of one, if not both, because it's going to take the edge off the pay-per-view, and nobody's... Oh, we used to run Sunday afternoon all the time. Goddamn, we used to draw. Everybody used to draw. Wrestling used to draw. But it's not going to anymore. You're going to kill Chicago. If you do it in New York, you're going to kill New York. WrestleMania weekend, maybe they can get by with it, but it ain't going to work anywhere else. I said, so you're going to kill our best towns. You're going to kill the guys physically. The production crew is going to fucking mutiny. And <laughs> from a booking and continuity standpoint, we have to do a promo day on Friday to do all the pre-tapes that go in the TV show. So we're going to do a promo day on Friday talking about the pay-per-view that takes place the next day in past tense, hoping that everything turns out the way we want it, and then shoot TV on Sunday. I said, why did you let him get away with this? 
Well, Jim, if you had been on the call, you could... I said, you're a grown fucking man. There were grown fucking men on this phone call. And nobody said this.